One. Okay, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Blown Speakers, episode seven. And today we are going to welcome our very special guest, Soggy. Welcome, Soggy. Well, thank you, thank you, Dave, thank you. Coming Much in appreciated, from, uh, pleasure to be here. Oh, uh, we're, we're honored to have you. Coming in from Chiba, Japan, right? Yeah, one of those places, you know, that's not in Tokyo. So I'm kind of west of Tokyo and you're east of Tokyo, basically. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> kind of in the middle of right, right, nowhere, as far as I'm concerned, but, uh, you know, not not that far from Tokyo, technically. So. Hmm. You could still make it into Tokyo when, when need be, right? I can, and I do, you know, and occasionally it is needed, you know. It must I be. I don't have not. everything in Chiba. <laughs> <laughs> and Greg, Greg is here as usual. Hey, Greg, in the middle of middle of somewhere, <laughs> um, um, Buffalo. Yep. Mm -hmm. Happy to be here. Yeah, and happy to um, um, have Sagi on with us, aka yeah. you may know. Yes. Um, oh. So today awesome. we are talking about um, Angel and Heavy Syrup 4, their fourth album, obviously, from 19, 1999. Um, well, the first time I saw this album or knew of this band is in the, um, as we mentioned before in our episode about the Flaming Lip Lips, um, uh, I lived at the you and I house, right, in, in Japan. It was a guest house for many foreigners who were living in Japan. And we used to hang out in the smoking room. And the smoking room was a hotbed for um, exchanging radical ideas. <laughs> that was the place to be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so we'd, we'd often talk about music. And uh, so Jason, you and, or uh, Soggy, you and Don, our previous guest, you guys both arrived at the same time. It was about May of 99, I think, right? Literally the same flight, I think, mm. actually, mm. oddly enough. We didn't know that at the time, though. But. And, um, yeah, I just remember the first time I talked to you about music, and you were, yeah, into a lot of noise and experimental stuff. And uh, I think we had a late night, and... Uh, then just the next morning, you came in my room and you just dropped off this massive box of CDs. There were like forty or fifty. Yeah, CDs I, I, I heard. There. I heard. I heard you mention this story, and I have no recollection of it. But it's yeah. it's a very cool story. I like it. Well, I think I think we actually live right next door to each other, right? Weren't you? Wasn't your room next door to mine before you? Yeah, got yeah. Well, that was the thing. I I I did my best. I, I had two boom boxes that I bought, and I would blast them right next to the wall where David was, just you know, just <laughs> to entertain him. Yeah. yeah but you uh yeah you dropped <laughs> off this massive box of cds must have been um 40 or 50 cds and i i just started yeah. flipping through them and yeah the name angel and heavy syrup definitely jumped out at me i thought it was a very cool name and um, as they say in japan anjanin mm. oh really anjanin how do they say it well I, well i would i i would assume i would assume Angel. it would be oh, Angel. 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 yeah <laughs> Just, just like the girl's name, Angeline, you know. Uh, um, possibly. So that was my that was my introduction. I listened to uh, yeah, I started listening to those albums, and uh, yeah, you turned me on to some some cool stuff. Um, yeah, so we'll get in we'll get into talking about this album, but for now, I'll uh, yeah, I'll hand the floor over to you. All and, right, uh, take it away, Soggy. <laughs> Okay, so I've got a couple things to do. First, uh, I'd like to start with a little caveat. Uh, the caveat goes like this. Um, Angel and Heavy Syrup is basically like a kind of psychedelic pop, prog, rock, kraut rock influenced band from Japan from the 90s, early 90s to well, through, through the whole 90s actually. Um, and the whole first part of my little spiel that I'm about to do is going to have nothing to do with any of that. Yeah. Uh, so just, just leaving that as it is for the moment. Um, 
what I would instead like to do is give you a little anecdote. And the anecdote is my first encounter with uh, Angeline Hay Syrup in a record shop in Toronto. Actually, it was a bookshop called Seekers Books uh, in Toronto. And, uh, you know, there prominently displayed was uh, the first Angel and Heavy Syrup uh, album, uh, eponymously named album. Um, and the proprietor of the record shop, a uh, very cool guy, um, had put a sticker on it. And the sticker said, utterly barbaric Japanese noise. Wow. So I'm looking at this saying, okay, I know, I already know this band. So I'm like, what? Um, but okay. Uh, utterly barbaric Japanese noise. Uh, that's, that's the whole anecdote. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is just play you a clip. Um, this is, and I hope the sound actually works. Uh, this is the first track from the album uh, from Angel and Heavy Surf 4. <clears throat> it's called Hatsukoi, which I believe roughly translates as first love. Ain't that sweet. But just remember, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> this is utterly barbaric Japanese noise. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so there you have it. Some utterly barbaric Japanese noise for you. Um, yeah, so I don't know. So, some people might be wondering about that. Um, so do you, th do you think that, and you said it was Seekers Bookstore? Uh, that's right, yes. Uh, is it still there, Jason? <laughs> you know, uh, that's one of wanna, the things that I actually I go investigate before I got, got on here, but I, I didn't. Uh, I haven't been there for a very long time. I, I hope so. I, I kind of yeah. hope that they're still there, uh, but I have no idea. Yeah. Um, so do you think the, the owner of the shop was just familiar with their connection to the Osaka noise scene, and, or was he... Kind of, was that kind of a, a joke? Well, yeah, and you see, I'm, I'm kind of glad you asked that question, Greg, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there's probably a, a way to answer that, which we can probably answer in, in, in two ways. The first might be a little bit lengthy uh, and might go into some of the background of, of Japanese noise itself. Um, and secondly, we can go into the Osaka side. So. Uh, if you'll kind of bear with me, um, maybe a little bit of background on, I guess, um, 
again, this is a very slanted background based only on, you know, my own intake of, of it. <clears throat> I would probably estimate, and maybe some other people would estimate, the Japanese noise would have started probably in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, uh, the band Hijo Kaiden and the man uh, Jojo Hiroshige. Remember that name, Hiroshige, Jojo Hiroshige. That's very important here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he he would have done his thing even maybe prior to the formation of his band Hijo Kaiden uh, in probably 1980 or 1979, which is just you know pure noise. But that that kind of thing didn't really catch on in say the States and in my case, Canada, and I guess Europe, uh, probably not until the late, late eighties or early nineties even. So we're talking like a full decade uh, before, you know, in let's say the popular culture, popular consciousness or uh, really of, uh, you know, the West, it, it, it really began to be a, a word, Japanese noise. Um, and probably what started to catch people's eye were the more uh, kind of over-the-top antics that you would get um, or over-the-top album covers and over-the-top names and stuff like that. And so we had names like, uh, you must know, Masana mm -hmm. from, I guess he started in 1989. Uh, there was Violent Onsen Geisha. <laughs> um, those were distributed on uh, silent records. Uh, they were released on a label called Vanilla, which I believe is also based in Osaka, but distributed in the U.S. on silent records. Um, so they got a lot of distro in the States. Uh, another, another band, uh, Ghetto Getty Gay Gay Gay, also had a lot of distribution, and they also caught a lot of people's attention. Uh, one notable album entitled uh, Tokyo Anal Dynamite. Um, and then there was uh, the Hanatarashi, Hana, or Hanatarash, um, and uh, they were quite noted also for their stage antics, uh, maybe in the mid 80s, but I don't know again if people back in the U US and Canada really knew anything about the fact that he was taking a forklift and driving it through the venue and smashing it up. Um, <laughs> But maybe what caught people's eye was, you know, on the Hannah Trash sleeve cover, maybe their second album, you know, he would have a kind of manifesto printed, you know. And at this time, the big bands, there were a lot of big uh, experimental artists coming out of the UK, like White House, Current 93, Nurse with Wound, uh, and those kind of names. And, um, then here's Hannah Tarash with a, a statement. Um, man, I, 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 should, I should pull it up somewhere, but I can't find it. But it, was ba it basically went like this. It was like, uh, fuck White House, asshole C93, fuck Coil, we love disco sound. And so you can kind of see how that would just catch people's attention, you know? And uh, so that kind of became a thing and people wanted to know about Japanese noise. And, you know, it really went against a lot of ideas of maybe what was coming out of Japan at the time, uh, at least from my point of view. Um, yeah, so people just wanted to know more about Japanese noise. And meanwhile, people started putting out compilations, uh, the, full, the only point of which was to just introduce uh, Japanese music to Western audiences. I guess the first compilations that came out were things like Dead Tech which is a compilation, which basically focused on more underground psychedelic music. But that didn't quite make the same splash that Japanese noise seemed to. And then so there were other compilation albums that started to come out. And uh, for example, there was one called Land of the Rising Noise on a label called Charnel House. Actually, it only had two noise, uh, noise artists on the, on the album. Um, Again, Hijo Kaiden, uh, who I've mentioned, and, and Merzbau, who maybe everybody knows. And all the others were, were like the full gamut of, you know, blues, rock, psychedelic, pop, industrial, whatever, whatever music. Um, maybe the title Land of the Rising Noise playing on that idea of, you know, uh, 
you know, noises coming out of Japan, but it wasn't just yeah. noise. It was all kind of all kinds of music, and there was a lot of confusion about Japanese noise. And there was a bit of a joke too that anything coming out of Japan was automatically labeled Japanese noise. It didn't matter what it was, you know. So, and incidentally, uh, Angel and Heavy Syrup was on that album, Land of the Rising Noise, which I think was released in 1990 or 91. Again, I don't have. The information um, right now I, I should but jason the the album you saw in the record store in toronto with the with the or what did it say was it a warning or no it just said bark it was, yeah it was a, i guess a sticker slash warning you know maybe maybe to kind of promote the album you know get okay. someone to buy it you know because japanese imports were really expensive at that time you know like you'd walk into tower records you know and, and you get a J japanese import for 40 dollars right it's like mm. eesh but, and I'm like 16 um, years old and I've got my, you know, my high school money, you know, and it's like, okay, I'm not going to necessarily drop 40 bucks on a Japanese import. So you'd want people to buy this stuff. You said it was Maybe, said barbaric, harsh noise. Is that right? Is that what you said? Utter, yeah, well, that's what that's, I think that's what I recall being written okay. was yeah, utterly barbaric Japanese that noise. Was, that was uh, Angel and Heavy Syrup 1, their first album? That was their first album. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is it... it now, is the first album much different than because what we just listened nope. to was very? You know. No, no, the first album is is very much yeah. consistent with that. You know, so okay. uh -huh. you know, like so, I you know, at the time that I saw it in the shop, I I, I kind of brought it to the proprietor of the shop, and I'm like, uh, you know, I, I don't think it sounds like this at all. He's like, really? I said, yes, it does. It's 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 Japanese barbaric noise. I'm like, no, it's not. Trust me, trust me. Okay, let's let's just put it on. So like, you know, I. This, this guy was really cool and he'd play whatever you want, you know, so you could listen to it in the shop, you know, just chill out, listen to the music and decide if you want to buy it kind of deal, right? So the guy's pretty cool. Uh, really cool. And uh, so we we put it on and, you know, the, the music comes on very much like that kind of nice, soft, psychedelic, bluesy stuff. And we're just sitting there laughing. And then he's like, well, you know, it's because it was on Alchemy Records, Alchemy Records. So part two of my little spiel is, is the label, Alchemy Records, which was run by none other than Jojo Hiroshige of Hijo Kaiden. I think the label mainly dealt with a lot of punk uh, music and also noise as well, and but also a fairly wide range of other kind of, you know, psychedelic etc kind of music uh but you know being that he was jojo hiroshige of hijo kaiden and incidentally the self-declared king of noise to correspond with their album which came out in 1985 called king of noise um <laughs> with a with a manifesto on it you know like fuck john zone not zorn zone death all avant-garde artists. I am Hijo Kaiden. I am king of noise. Like that. So, you know, I, I, I like that attitude. And that was Alchemy Records, Jojo Hiroshige's label. Um, and uh, when he would put out real noise, good noise, he'd call it good alchemy. So he had a series called the Good Alchemy series. That's the good Alchemy Records, Murs Bow, if anyone knows noise, it would be Mersbau, Incapacitance, uh, Hijo Kaiden, in this case, Soul Mania, uh, and actually later on, Masana and uh, Ob as well, uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, so it, it would be understandable for people to get mixed up and just stick a label on anything coming out of Alchemy Records, you know, as utterly barbaric Japanese noise, you know. And it, it could be deceptive because, you know, you could, you would have, and I can, if I can just share a little screen with you, I hope this works. Where are we? Okay. Yeah, this one. So for example, you would have uh, an album that looked like this. That's right. Very like peaceful. Kind of nice. Are those, uh, what? Tennis rackets and uh, yeah, racquetball, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, don't, don't look, if you actually see Jojo Hiroshige in action, at least from this album onward, from let's say the late 90s onward, he actually looks like a tennis instructor. <laughs> or, or as it's put in, uh, in a review on an album, he looks like a tennis instructor having an epileptic seizure, like with his you know, guitar. 
but uh, you know, a very, very unassuming kind of kind of look. But it would it would sound quite different, and I'll just stop that share of the image and try and pull up the sound. And are you able to get the sound, guys? Looks okay. like it. Mm. Yeah, so yes. it would sound it would sound quite different. It would sound more like this. I mean, the confusion would be understandable <laughs> under those circumstances. Yeah, um, quite a contrast know. from the sunny beach racquetball. Yeah. Image, yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, Jojo Hiroshige. Yeah. Hiroshige. Jason, what, is there any relation relationship to KG Hino? Am I? Well, you know, KG Hino. Uh, he actually had been going probably even longer than uh, Hiroshige. He's got like uh, guitar noise albums from like 1977 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and he kind of comes in on the kind of psychedelic, more psychedelic end of things, I guess, um, or yeah. froggy end of things. So he would, he would be there. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of his stuff was released by PSF. Uh, records in Japan, which is run by uh, Mr. Nanjo. I think it's Asahito Nanjo, if I've got the name right. Um, who incidentally also recorded uh, an album or two with uh, Itakuda Mineko of uh, Angeline Hebisura. So, oh. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's quite this, shall we say, fairly incestuous relationship with all these people. I mean, uh, a lot of them concentrated in the two urban centers of Osaka. Kansai area and Tokyo, respectively. I mean, it would be hard for me to imagine that they wouldn't know each other. Uh, but I mean, as far as I can tell, I don't think Haino and Hiroshige hung out as, you know, good buddies or anything. But, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, what, now it's, if I can uh, jump in here. Yeah. Well, I, I was mentioning to Dave earlier, I had, um, I have a friend here in Buffalo who's, well, she's more into experimental music, but it's far more, you know, it's it's far more conventional than than noise. Um, yeah. But she's she's open minded and yeah, and she was aware of utterly barbaric Japanese noise. So when I told her in this is ninety nine, I guess ninety nine, mm -hmm. right? Ninety nine. Yeah. When I realized, or when I was planning to come to Japan, yeah. She's like, oh yeah, you know noise is is really big in in japan and <laughs> and i thought it was kind of an extension of that that utterly barbaric japanese noise sentiment kind of the hype the hype surrounding those yeah, things yeah. As you talked about you know yeah. but it's, it's so funny fun. because when i got to japan yeah. one of the first people i met uh was you who was <laughs> right very connected to um you know a noise artist yourself and then you know, plugged into the uh, Tokyo noise scene, the, well, the Japanese, the utterly quite, barbaric Japanese noise scene, so. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of noise being produced in Japan, but you'd talk to a, like even a Japanese noise artist, and they're, they're like, ha, 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 what? People listen to this? No. You know, or you'd, you'd walk into a record shop of, you know, dealing with experimental music, and they'd be like, noise? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just garbage. You know, and even or you know, you talk to Japanese people. Noise? What's what's what are you talking about? Yeah, There's yeah, nothing yeah. like that in Japan. Are you crazy? You know, so you know what? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, was, it was big in Japan, but I, I guess it's um, you know I think this has been commented by other upon by other people, but you know I think the phenomenon of Japanese noise didn't really 
catch on in Japan until it kind of caught on in the West and Europe. Yeah. And people started to put out these albums and distribute artists locally. And, you know, then it would kind of come back into Japan. Oh, look, Japanese noise as well. It's well known in Japan, you know, all over the world. It must be, must be good. Yeah. You know, you know. And until it was recognized by, you know, the Europeans, it was crap. Right, something. right. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just exaggerating. No, but that, but that makes sense. Kind of like it took like, well, it's oversimplified, but like the Beatles to kind of acquaint a lot of Americans, North Americans with, sure. um, you know, yeah. blues, rhythm and blues music from African Americans. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about the story? And wasn't there a story like when Lou Reed first came to Japan? Oh, see, that's exactly what I was going to talk about, Greg. Um, <clears throat> just to you, what you said about expectations of noise music uh, mm -hmm. before coming to Japan. So I'm pretty sure I read this in the liner notes of Lou Reed's uh, box set that I had. Um, I forget what it's called, but um, Metal Machine Music, uh, yeah. late 70s, maybe? Yep, Mid yep, yep, yep. Yeah. 70, uh, 77, 78, 75, 76. <laughs> okay, mid, yeah. mid, mid to late 70s, right? When, yeah. so Lou Reed, I because think. Because it was, you know, in that book, Please, Please Kill Me. You yeah. know, the oral history of American oh. punk. Is that where the story was? Um, no, I don't think oh. so. But they talk about, you know, that there was a, a zine uh, called Punk. Yeah. And Lou, they got Lou Reed for one, one of the early issues. He's on the cover. And they got the editor, John Hol Holstrom, was really... And it was the time that Metal Machine Music had come out. So 1975. Oh, five. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was thinking 76, 77, but yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Yeah. But the story on those liner notes, if I remember correctly, and, and that album is just like all feedback, basically, right? So basically, it's, um, guitar, guitar feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the metal machine being the guitar. Yeah. And I guess now that I think about that, would if if people call that noise music, that would have been the first noise music I heard because I had mm -hmm. the box set and there were a couple tracks off metal yeah. machine music in the box set but there was a story on the inside that it was the album was big in japan and, then, and i'm like what well, it, when well, lou yeah, reed when lou reed got off the plane in narita i'm guessing that in the airport they were playing metal machine music oh really yeah cool. um, i can i can believe that yeah. really you okay, probably why, tell me that story yeah why why would you believe that i mean i why I not? found that kind of, well, I mean, it's pretty abrasive music to just be blasting to people walking through airports. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> oh, no. oh. <laughs> but I, li I like the story. Yeah, 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 yeah me too. And, and it is, yeah, it is pretty sure. I'll, I'll verify it. You can definitely, it you, I think you can I definitely see how that would be, yeah, how that would be inspirational. I think Hiroshige, there's a, there's a great YouTube video, it's like a two-minute video, where he describes his inspiration for noise. He's like, you know that really exciting part of the rock song, you know, like when Jimi, Hen Jimi Hendrix, you know, that the guitar is feeding back that really cool part? Well, I just basically just did, you know, when I, when I was in high school, that really struck a chord with me, maybe literally. And I just kept on doing that. That's it. I just kept on doing that, you know. Um, I guess that's that may be, for me, what kind of separates, you know, noise from Japan or Japanese noise from, let's say, doing a one-off called Metal Machine Music. It's like Hiroshige says, no, that's what I want to do, only that, mm -hmm. you know. And he even says that, you know, even for the first 10 years of the band, he couldn't quite achieve what he wanted to. It took 10 years to really, you know, get the sound to the level that they wanted. Uh, you know, the total disorganized, chaotic, crazy screaming insanity full energy you know and you know and a lot of that in the early days of hydrokinin there was a lot of negative imagery and vibes and things like that but it kind of by 1989 it was you know all this kind of just pure energy and that was what it was all about anyway i've kind of gone off, that, gone that, off a little bit that track you just played us by Hijo yeah. I done. Um, yeah. what, what year was that, did you say? That, that was from, well, that was a live track from 91. I think the album also was released in 91. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's that, actually a, a, a super group consisting of uh, Merzbao on drums, Masami Akita on drums. We had 
Kosakai was also screaming. I guess he was the, the bass screamer. <laughs> I think M Mikawa was doing his electronics plus screaming. He might have been the alto screamer. I think Hiroshige is also screaming. Plus, of course, Junko, who's the main screamer, the, the, uh, the soprano screamer. Uh, yeah, so it's just, and all the feedback. <laughs> yeah, that album uh, was, is, is a great album. Uh, for, for my money, 1989, an album called Modern released on CD. It's a 74 minute single track, <laughs> which is basically as much as you can fill up on the CD of just, you know, the total chaotic feedback, screaming noise, you know, that, yeah. that's where I, yeah. So they what really what you it. just played, I mean, the, uh, the track you just played, so is that considered harsh noise? Um, yeah, I would say so, um, you know, um, probably. Okay. <laughs> um, it would depend on depend on your perspective. Some people feel that uh, you know the proper harsh noise should contain I don't know more more oomph, more of that sub subsonic those those heavily distorted uh, sounds. But no, definitely I would I would put that in the category of harsh noise. Even though you can hear the guy drumming away, that's uh, that's okay. In Hydrokaiden, they they can get away with it because the sound is just so incredibly insanely you know energetic and overwhelming but it is if you play it properly not through your crappy you know computer speaker yeah yeah then if you want to listen to it properly just you know blast your blast it <laughs> as far as i'm concerned so yeah um yeah so um right, let's see um, Sorry. well i'm thinking yeah what would be jason what would you say for harsh noise like you know the the for, I don't know, past 10, 20 years, the vinyl resurgence and, you know, well, audio files have been around for a long time. And the noise guys, is more like the, the tape resurgence. What, 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 would you, what would you say is the, the proper um, medium to listen to harsh noise? Would, would you say, you know, uh, I would, does it matter? I, would, I, I don't vinyl think versus says, analog versus digital or any specifics as far as a stereo setup. Oh, hey. yeah. What yeah. do I got here? A fail association blind date. Now, is that because? Would you say because of the sound quality or like that's? No, just, no. You know, well, you know, you talk to you talk to. Talk to five different, uh, you know, harsh noise people and you'll get five different answers. But my take is uh, to take a book out of the Trump uh, Trump lexicon. It is what it is. The format is what it is. I mean, you, people may release on certain formats for certain reasons. Some people may have a fetishistic attachment to the idea of a cassette. Uh, right, right. <laughs> love the smell of a cassette in the morning or whatever, you know, uh, or some people feel somehow the analog signal of, a, of an LP or something like that might be more, you know, warmer or more real or something. And some people like the clarity and the, the frequency range of, say, a, a, of, a, of a CD, although, you know, now we've got even higher end formats that maybe even a CD can't handle. Um, so, so there's different perspectives. Uh, a lot of people like the idea that you can really push a cassette, you know, to just, you know, to just max out, uh, to create this totally insanely blown out sound. So a lot of people like that. My, my take on it is, you know, whatever the artist deems, you know, necessary is, is you know, that's, it's, you know, it's half, it's half the art is the chosen format, the, the artwork and all the rest of it. It's all, it all goes together. I mean, for me, it's just, it's just about the sound, but, if they want to put it on tape, fine, I'll buy your tape. And if you want to put it on an eight track or some insane format, fine, I'll buy that too. And that's, and I'll enjoy it just as much. So there's my really convoluted answer for you. But there are a lot, a lot of guys who just, just love to put their shit out on tape. <laughs> tape. Mm. They love their tapes. Mm. These are all, these are all awesome tapes. Um, so yeah. Uh, Jason, our friend. Uh, I've got. Yasutoki has metal machine music on eight track. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. 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 So he, yeah. I, 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 he sent me a tape once, which was 
uh, it was just the tape totally unspooled in a bag. You know, <laughs> I'm like, how the hell do I freaking play this? You know, I mean, I, I, I kind of tried to kind of feed the, the, the ribbon through the machine. Uh, <laughs> it would just, you know, it, it's already half eaten anyway. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, I think he actually, he also did release, he, he has an eight track release of his own. So yeah, it's so unplayable format. Uh, maybe the ultimate would be, um, there was a release called Manipulation Muzak, Muzak, which I think you get a chunk of raw vinyl with instructions for, you know, heating and flattening. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just take it as far as you can. Or yeah. the Ghetto Getty Gay Gay Gay, they, they you know, uh, their, their seven inch release party, they stuck all the seven inches in a big pile and burned them all. But I think you can, what you were actually buying was the the ashes from the burnt thing and you know maybe you could enjoy the atmosphere of that so yeah but anyway if you're a proper if you're a proper noise head you know if you're a proper noise head tape cassette all right tape cassette yeah um so okay so um if you if you chaps will bear with me uh we've talked a little bit about noise but maybe we want to get on to angeline heavy syrup a little bit more would that be all right Sure. Yeah. And one of the one of the inspirations, one of the way, uh, one of the converging points I feel for Jojo Hiroshige and uh, Angel and Heavy Syrup, uh, I guess the two uh, the two original members who stuck with the band throughout the whole four album lifespan, uh, that being uh, Mineko. Itakura. Uh, yeah. Okay. So which which ones? Uh, yeah. So sorry. Uh, yeah. The the girl in the, the the woman in the middle. Uh, that being Itakura Mineko. And you'll notice. Okay, she, it's written there. Angel and Heavy Syrup is Mineko Itakura, voices and bass. And the woman on the left, Mine Nakao, guitar and voices. Those were the two original members. And Ms. Fusao Toda, she came on in the second album. Um, but I feel that the convergence of these two persons, uh, Mineko and Mine, uh, meeting Jojo Hiroshige, probably at some event, uh, maybe psychedelic slash noise event in Osaka, uh, were what kicked it off because uh, Hiroshige you know, he writes a lot of the liner notes for his CDs, and you'll find he's probably written the liner notes for this one, too. And he says, you know, my true baby, my great child that I love forever is Angel and Heavy Syrup. He's the producer of this band. Um, and one thing that also brought in the convergence, aside from their love of kraut rock, and just by the way, speaking of you know, harsh noise. I just love the fact that you take any Japanese noise artist, I mean, the, the true, the gods, Mersbau, Hijo, Kaiden, Incapacitance, CCCC, you know, they will, their whole thing is, you know, kraut rock. They just love it, you know. And if you, you'll find Mikawa, you know, playing a lot of live shows on, on the cover, he's always got his new, new, t new t shirt on and stuff. They just, love kraut rock like you're supposed to relate that hawk wind silver apples mikawa you play an instrument called the mikawa why well because uh you know simeon from uh you know uh, silver apples plays something called the simeon or something like that so it's like yeah <laughs> uh anyway so here are these two mine mineko meeting jojo hiroshige presumably at some evento in osaka or kansai and aside from uh, their love of kraut rock and prog and psychedelic music and all that, uh, there's another artist from the 70s, and her name is um, Morita Doji. <clears throat> and if I could just find a picture of her for you, hopefully uh, this will actually work this time. <laughs> all right, so. <laughs> Kinda, oh, I, I can't actually share. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, here, I'll give you a picture. Tell me if you can see this. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we so have there, that, there she is. That black thing. Mori, Mori Doji, uh, psych, uh, not psychedelic, folk, cult folks, folk singer from the 70s. 
uh, I think her first album was in 1975. Um, and she, she actually died fairly recently, just a few years ago, unfortunately. Uh, and she was a major inspiration for Hiroshi Gay. Um, uh, in fact, he's, he's written extensively about her. Um, you, if you can, you can probably, if you look up in Japanese, you know, Jojo Hiroshige and Mori uh, Doji, uh, you will probably find lots of things, or at least a few things that he's written about her. Um, and, you know, I, I would say she was a, I don't know when he first heard her, possibly also when he was in high school, I'm not sure, but also aside from her influence on Mr. Hiroshige. Uh, she was also a major influence on at least Itakura Mineko and Angeline Hevisura. Uh, there are at least two cover songs. Uh, they, they covered two Morita Doji songs in their repertoire. Uh, so yeah, they, they obviously love her and she would have been a big inspiration. And um, and she would, she was like kind of experimental folk. You're saying? I would put her in the category of pure, just good old folk. folk. Good old folk. I mean, so she had maybe some songs that might have been a little bit experimental, but I would say the vast majority are just beautiful, gorgeous folk songs. Um, and I would highly recommend anyone who cares about music of any kind to check her out because she's just totally awesome. Um, what I'm going to try to do is actually share the sound, although it looks like I can't right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Morita Doji, uh, and uh, this is a song called, I think, um, maybe Densho Batok. It means carrier pigeon, um, off her album Maza Sky from 1976. Um, and big influence on, I, in my opinion, on Angeline Heavy Syrup's origins. <laughs> That's not the whole album, but at the end of the song, she's she's asking her mother or the mother sky to uh, to shoot dead her carrier pigeon. Uh, wow. to bring. It's heavy stuff. I mean, it's or heavily existential stuff. I mean, you know, it's very interesting music. Um, I think she's a very interesting character. Uh, so that that's that's Ms. Morita Doji, and uh, uh, I've. She was a major influence on uh, Itakura Mineko. Uh, here, so Jason, like, the, the name of that song, or you said the name of the album is Mother Sky, right? That's yeah, a, that's right. There's a Can song, a song by Can called yeah. Mother Sky, I think from a few years before. Is she yeah. doing that in tribute to Can? Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I can't say for sure, but I mean, given the influence of, um, 
kraut rock in Japan. It's perfectly within the bounds of possibility. But you know, I mean, I don't know. Sorry, hmm. I, I that I that I honestly don't know. Yeah, the the album has a subtitle, uh, which something which translates something like, uh, you know, can I fly alone in the blue sky of sorrow? So that's the mother's sky. You know, very melancholic. Um, Morito Doji actually became really big because uh, because of some of the appearance of her song in uh, some daytime or maybe evening uh, <clears throat> drama, TV drama, high, called High School or something like that. And uh, suddenly everyone knew knew her. So there, she got a big revival uh, in yeah. Japan oh. when that was released. Oh, hey! Oh. Hey there. <laughs> <laughs> no one... That's uh oh, and Graham. All right, hey guys. Hey, how you guys doing? All right. Yeah, they they often make an appearance on blown yeah. speakers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I I would say that uh you know Ms. Itakura definitely was influenced by this. Um, here I'd like to play another very very brief clip of uh a recent solo joint by uh, Itakura. Uh, if you guys are able to hear that with your speaker. Well, it looks like it. Hmm. Okay. This title, this is called uh, hmm, Heart of the Flower from a compilation in 2006. It's just her voice and folk, uh, you know, acoustic guitar. <laughs> clips I promise we have the meeting of Ms. Itakura and here's Jojo Hiroshige's own solo work. Um, this is a track entitled uh, Jigoku which roughly translates as hell and it's actually written with an exclamation mark. Uh, so uh, here's Hiroshige with, uh, with hell. <laughs> おなじ空気なんか吸いたくない。いやな、やつばかり。みんな死んでしまえばいいのに。
guy. <laughs> so you're probably so wondering. There, sorry. So that was a Morita Doji cover there. Uh, that yeah, maybe it, it was from her unreleased. Yeah, unreleased uh, titles. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> at the, at the end, that you know, at at the end with that feedback at the end, that was kind of bringing to mind. What what I heard from Metal Machine music, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Hir Hiroshige, he's yeah, he's quite funny. He um, he says the main reason he uses a guitar is because it gives the audience something to relate to. You know, if I just stand behind a synthesizer or like some other signal generator like Mikawa, people just don't know what the hell I'm doing. But with a guitar. He doesn't just play any guitar, though. He plays like a kind of customized. Yeah, guitar. that makes sense. I mean, for me, you know, conditioned to seeing an electric guitar, you know, yeah. a, you know, just a rock and roll fan, but, you know, just conditioned yeah. to see that. It's almost like, yeah, oh, yes, okay, that's an authentic instrument. And that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it did, I was saying at the beginning, so it's is uh, would you say all most of his noise is based from guitar because it well, sounded like yeah, it sounded yeah basically like everything he does is almost on. I mean the tempo and you could still hear some semblance of a guitar yeah you know distorted yeah, guitar so it was like making me think of uh, you know like hardcore yeah he's punk. just playing guitar like yeah the only thing he ever plays is guitar as far as I I can tell like a like a, a few of his more recent. Uh, solo albums he's brought in other instruments you know in players drummers yeah. actually he brought in the drummer from angel and heavy syrup actually to play with him on it on, on his last album so and that mm. sounds much more like kind of hard rock with the kind of a noise vibe because the guitar is not regular guitar mostly noise guitar some some of his tracks are more rock in them so yeah yeah so yeah yeah um yeah <laughs> So like, you're probably wondering like, when are we gonna get to anything that's even slightly more, you know, directly Angel and Heavy Syrup related and why am I playing all this crap? Well, so there was a short-lived project, um, uh, a short-lived project. I'm actually gonna screen share, so you might wanna pull that off uh, if you don't mind it. Yeah, it was called uh, Slap Happy Humphrey. And it was a Morita Doji cover band, actually. Um, if I can find, find that. Uh, here we are. Slap Happy Humphrey, okay. And I'm trying to show you a picture of these uh, guys. Not the, not the name I would have expected for the project. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's Slap Happy Humphrey. Uh, it's, okay. It was a one-off project. Uh, they did a seven inch uh, then they did a full album. This is from their full album. Uh, that's just Hiroshi a Day. moment. Sorry, Jason. There, um, there's that oh, you black know what? square. I, yeah, yeah, I, I still look at that too. Have I moved the square off? No. No. Okay. Yes. No, Wait. Yeah. Good. Where's good. Good. It's no, gone. I, yeah. I, I, I actually full. had I had your your video overlapping that. Okay. Yeah. Right. Apologies. Yeah. So that slap happy Humphrey, Jojo on the left, uh, Itako. Takada Mineko in the middle, and Mr. Fujiwara, who plays violin. Uh, there they are. There they are. There they are. Yeah, so that's Slap Happy Humphrey. Um, and it's just, it's, it's eight songs. Uh, all of them are just Morita Doji covers. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe as just to kind of wrap up this incredibly extended spiel. I'm gonna try to share with you a piece of audio from that too. Uh, if you'll be able to hear this, yes, okay. Let's see if I can get this up. So this is uh, this is actually gonna be two tracks. One is gonna fade into another one, but it's, it's basically what you would get when you'd get the noise god, Jojo Hiroshige, uh, and uh, the lovely Mineko Itakura on, you know, acoustic guitar and vocals and, uh, you know, covering Morita Doji songs. Uh, sorry. No, that's not it. That's, that's hell again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry. 
Okay, here's here's Slap Happy Humphrey. Interesting production, like they do kind of make it work. You would think they would um, cancel yeah. each other out somehow, but they do work together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I had another clip pulled up too, just to kind of illustrate another thing, but I might I might skip it because getting going a bit, bit overboard here with the clips, but uh, there's a great, Kiroshige writes about, uh, you know, the semi, the cicada, right? And he, he, he writes about it when he's introducing uh, uh, Mori Tadoji in one of his essays, uh, you know, The Sound of the Sakaida. And if anyone who's been to Japan or in parts of the States with the Sakaida, they're bloody loud. They drown out everything. They're like, I once had one on my balcony, you know, back when I was living in Tokyo and I just stepped outside and the thing just went, ah, Jesus. I mean, I like noise, but, you know, it was like five in the morning and this thing scared the hell out of me because it's bloody loud. Um, and it just, and uh, actually the, the song that I played for you, the Morita Doji song that I played for you, at the end of the song, uh, she, she brings in a, a cicada, which just comes in and totally drowns out the acoustic guitar. And it's just this machine-like insect. It's just, you know, and it, it goes on slightly longer than you would expect after a sweet, beautiful folk song, you know. Then Jojo Hiroshige, of course, with Slap Happy Humphrey has to cover that song. And instead of the cicada, he does it with his guitar. But very similar, you know. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, I, I, I like that kind of 
I don't know. He's he he's got a certain, you know, he he does it with a certain degree of you know taste and uh, you know, I don't know. The, the guy's they, they could have the most incongruous band name as far as the, their sound because Slap Happy Humphrey. I mean, it sounds like you know, like they're going to be like a ska band from you know ska <laughs> punk band from. I, I think know, 1994 on the Warp Tour. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I should have brought in the trivia about the name. It, it's a combination of two, but one one half of the name is the name of a wrestler. You know. Oh. Okay. And, oh I, wait. I, I, wait. I, yeah. Okay. The first part. Wait. No. Possibly or possibly Humphrey. I forget. Damn it. And then what's the? It's uh, one wrestler and another wrestler. No, it's, it's, uh, it, oh. Like, uh, Pink Floyd was too, you know, yeah. two notable blues artists that they liked. It, it might even be right in their Discogs entry. Uh, no, maybe not. Yeah, well, anyways, somewhere. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's good. It's great. Oh, wait, 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 okay, you're right, you're right, wait, 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 okay. Okay, according to this site that I've just found, it's an, it was an, yeah, okay, okay, well, oh, heard that, sorry, oops, isn't this slap, so it's, yeah, so there, there was a, the, the configuration that calls itself Slap Happy Humphrey, an arbitrary conflation of real pop faves slap happy and Canadian wrestler Happy Humphrey. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, this according to uh, someone. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just randomly pulled this off. Bringing that Canadian pride into it, Jason. Yeah, yeah, hey, <laughs> there you go. Nihilist Spasm Band. <laughs> <laughs> That's just for nice. Humphrey. No music um, festival. That's right. Um, should we should we um, dig into uh, number four? Yeah, I think it, it's the, probably... the actual LP. <laughs> it might be might be a time to do something like that. <laughs> yeah, Jason, what are what are some of your favorite tracks off this? You know, this is it's a funny thing because. Uh, of their whole discog, I think all my favorite songs are not on this album. You know, like I, I love Underground Railroad from their first album and, you know, uh, Crazy Blues, which is on the, which is actually appears on their first album, but also their second album. And uh, this album is uh, a bit dissimilar to the previous three in that it's more consistent in the sound. It doesn't, it doesn't vary a lot. It's not so proggy. Uh, it's it's more rockin'. It's more bluesy to my ear. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, as such, it doesn't really, nothing really stands out. I mean, maybe the, uh, well, maybe a series of Watermind is great. I, I, I like the longer songs, Voyage. It's called Voyage. Okay. Uh, a series of Watermind. Uh, for example, and the last track uh, fate. says "fate," but I thought I thought the title in Japanese was "to you." <laughs> but okay, maybe that's fate wrong. has. Fate. Um, that seems to have, even though it's a long track, it has more vocals in than the, than the other ones, doesn't it? If I the last one, yeah, is it? Yeah, well, that, that's actually something I also wanted to comment on, which is just you know the, the album doesn't have a lot of vocals you know they're more it's more like an instrumental band really and you know and i i kind of i'm i'm kind of thinking this is maybe another incongruous reference but you know the hip-hop artist dialect right and he often in the time he'd he'd sit his vocals pretty low in the mix right and one of the interviewers commented on that once and he says well you know i don't have a very big ego you know, I don't need my vocals to really jump out at you. It's more like a, it's, it's an instrument. It's part of the song, you know, mm. if you want to get into the lyrics, you can, but, and I kind of feel that way about Angelina Heavy Syrup, like, you know, Itakura, she's not, 
she's definitely not uh, on a soapbox or anything. It's, it's, it's very instrumental in her vocals. And if I were to choose a second clip to play, it would probably be uh, the, not the instrumental song, but uh, Space Conquest, which doesn't have any lyrics. It just consists of vocalizing, right? Just her angelic, you know, above the, I guess, the heavy syrup or something That's like that. That's kind of consistent with kraut rock, right? Like the kraut rock bands yeah. don't don't usually have this really um, in your face front man or anything, right? The um, yeah. the vocals are just kind of part of the mix, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll you know that you know yeah with angel and, angel and heavy syrup they'll just. Like for example, in their second track on the album, the vocals don't come in until like, uh, like how long is the song? It's like a eight minute song or something, and the, and the vocals don't come in until like more than halfway through. Yeah, <laughs> like almost as an afterthought. You know, meanwhile they're just like noodling and doing their 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 guitar bluesy thing, their psychedelic thing. You know, so yeah. So I, I took this listing from the uh, the YouTube clip that has the full album. Um, yeah. But I'm guessing the guy probably took it straight from the straight from the album. And it's interesting they don't say vocals; they just say voices, <laughs> <laughs> right? I guess. <laughs> kind I mean, of in line with that, that it's um, they're they're viewing it more as just an instrument. I, I guess. Yeah. I I I I don't have. It's, it, I probably have to exit to the screen for a while to pull up the stupid album to actually see what it says on the disc. But yeah, hmm. um, I can do that. No, what, I mean, yeah. Okay, yeah. you want to, you want to do that? Du, du, du. Just out of just all. Okay. I'll actually yeah, that, stop. Um, that guy has a nice YouTube channel. His name is Leonardo Ortiz, right? And he has all these full albums up on YouTube and a lot of um information about uh, a lot of the album like a lot of like psychedelic uh, stoner rock type stuff so um you yeah. see the guy who posted uh angel and heavy syrup yeah yeah this the, yeah, the full album yeah. um yeah so he's he's doing he's doing good work because it looks like he's you know putting up obscure albums in their entirety with a lot of you know information so Oh, I found that in record time. Amazing. Mm. Oh, nice. Okay, so that, oh. the album cover looks totally different from what I had. Yeah, I mean, that's oh. that's the cover okay. that I got. Okay, wow. Well, what's the thing I was showing them? <laughs> ah, wow, it looks completely different. Okay. I did see I like that, that. It's, it, too. But. I like that. It, it has that kind of Eastern, Eastern vibe to it, which... Yeah, goes well with the closing track on the album, which has that really kind of, you know, sounds like something kind of like Indian influenced or something like that. And uh, yeah, no, it, there there is no reference here. Oh, oh, wait. Yeah. Hmm. So, Jason, okay, well, it, it does actually say vocal. So she, it's, oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. So it, it credits her with bass and vocal. Yeah. Okay. So maybe it was uh, Leonardo Ortiz who did that <laughs> on his site. Yeah. But um, well, why do you think I have totally different artwork? I took this from uh, Discogs. Oh, I don't know. That's that was probably a re release. Okay. Yeah. Like this, this is, I guess, the original Alchemy release in 1999. Okay. Uh, that might have been a reissue, mm. possibly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Mono Mono Tremata Records uh, reissued this. Oh, okay. So that's what I'm going with. Yeah. All Mo right. Mono Tremata is actually a, a label run by none other than the man behind uh, the fanzine called not fanzine the the zine called Dead Angel. Hmm. And uh, he he reviewed. Uh, he wrote hilarious, really great, awesome uh, reviews of experimental industrial noise. And he was also a really big uh, Angel and Heavy Syrup fan, and he dubbed himself the High Epopt of the Cult of Mineko after 
Itakura Minako. Yeah. Oh. I guess I guess he's consummated this relationship uh, when he reissued that. In uh, what year was that? Uh, when was that reissue? Okay. Well, it only has the original date. Oh, it says, but it says 1999. Okay, so maybe it was just the stateside issue of the oh, same album. Okay. okay. So yeah. it's no. the same year. Uh, in, you know, he his he's based in Texas, yeah. so that would be like the domestic. I guess we call it the domestic release. You say he lives uh, in Texas? Is that what you say? Yep. 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 Okay. Um. Hmm. Which yeah. which album cover cover would you consider the official one? This one or the? Uh... Well, I mean, you know, Alchemy Records. Come on, man. It's got to be. Yeah. It's got to be Alchemy Records. Oh no, I'm just asking for uh, the purpose of thumbnails. Maybe I'll maybe oh. I'll use that. Um, maybe I'll yeah. use the your cover instead. Yeah, mm. do it. Do mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, the other cover's nice too, I suppose. <laughs> Quite a different vibe, though. Uh, yeah, obviously. it has that creepy, yeah. um, kind of creepy uh, kids' book thing we've talked about before. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the, the person who's who gets credit for a lot of the artwork on Alchemy is none other than uh, Masahiko Ono of uh, the guitar monster guitar band uh, Soul Mania, uh, and he does a huge number of. Uh, a huge amount of the artwork for Alchemy, and he once he once made a statement like, "I, I want the uh, I want the artwork to look like a design failure. That's what I want." Yeah, but I don't I don't I don't see that in this. I mean, I see like a very nicely, tastefully done, you know, psychedelic, you know, influenced record sleeve. So yeah, their no packaging always there. always look yeah. look yeah. cool. Mm. Uh, just a little trivia for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, uh, maybe just for fun, just to illustrate uh, here, uh, I can throw in one little, maybe this might be the second last clip I throw in for the day uh, of, Ange of Angeline Heavy Syrup. Uh, so, yeah, about the personnel, Jason, there's only three three members shown here, but there are actually four members in the band or what's what's the story exactly? Yeah, I mean, from what I've read, uh, this in this incarnation, the final incarnation, the fourth and final incarnation of the band, uh, the drummer was more uh, credited as, 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 as a guest, as though she wasn't really part of the band, you know. And keep in mind that you know, this, this album kind of came out of nowhere because the, the previous album, uh, Three, had been released in 1995. So that was four years prior. You know, so they, they had put out three albums consistently, you know, in 91, I think 91, 93, 95. And then, then they had a four year hiatus. And I kind of wonder, you know, if they just had difficulty, you know, keeping a drummer around <laughs> or, just finding a drummer who could just, who had the chops because this band is pretty tight, you know? Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, I wonder if that is one of the reasons. I'm, I'm sure there's all kinds of other mm. reasons that a band might discontinue, uh, but yeah. You yeah, need drummers. All, yeah, Sorry? most articles say like they didn't officially break up. It's more kind of just an indefinite hiatus that just- yeah, It's a pretty long hiatus ended. though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, bring back Angel and Heavy Syrup. Like, I'm, I'm surprised that just, you know, they, they just seem to get bigger and bigger or more and more well-known, you know, just anytime I just try to read about them. They've definitely got fans everywhere, you know, because they're bringing, you know, they've got that psychedelic proggy sound, I guess, but uh, it's not, it's not that weird, you know, there's definitely a more, you know, accessible pop element to it with the vocals, uh, with the way that's, uh, with the way that the music's put together, it's very soft and sweet, you know. Uh, there is the heavy syrup there, <laughs> but there's a lot of the angels in there too, you know. And so I'd maybe just like to play a little clip here of, uh, you know, illustrating, again, there's no lyrics here. There's just Itakura vocalizing 
um, uh, over, over the heavy syrup, so to speak, if I can just kind of get that sound on. Is it okay? Mm. Okay. So here we go. Uh, this track is called Space Conquest. Okay, I'm just going to play a little clip. I, I certainly see why people mention uh, Amundul. I think it does have elements of that, right? The, yeah, the Yeti yeah. album. Yeah, I would say I, it, it. It might be. It might be worth just very quickly and just visually running through the influences that were cited in an interview with the band. Uh, plus, also mentioned by Hiroshige himself in a couple of his essays, uh, and I'm just gonna kind of run through these very quickly uh just sharing the visual hopefully it'll jason how do you read his his essays where, where where do you get those you can find them online he also writes you know he quite a few uh, well some of the cds have essays written but you're you're one. reading english translations of those do my best you know mm. uh but you read the japanese i muddle through it and translate, model through, translate, model through, and understand nice. probably 20%. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> still, uh, uh, you can still get a pretty good vibe of, of where he's going with, uh, with his commentary. And anyway, if, you can certainly pick up the influences that he mentions, which uh, would include, if I can get this going properly. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. Oh, there you go. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, there we are. Amon Duel. Um. <clears throat> With the double, the double umlaut. <laughs> yeah. Umlaut. Yeah. I guess you'd say. This would be gong. Ah. Yeah. I mean, if you listen, if you listen to these guys, they're a lot wackier. They're they're a lot zanier than Angel and Heavy Syrup. Uh, but you know that 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 tendency just to wig out and just let the instruments go is, is definitely there. Uh, <laughs> this is just the link between Amon Duel and Gong. Uh, sorry, not Amon Duel and Gong. Gong and and and. Uh, Wait. So can you tell us who that who that was, Jason? Yeah. So that would be another another than none other than David Allen. Uh, who is credited. for our viewers? Can you? <laughs> Briefly explain. Yeah, he, well, he, he's credited with with um, putting together both uh, Gong 
and uh, soft machine, uh, respectively. So I, I think he would be he'd be a big link there. <laughs> um, and did I, he do did he do caravan, or is uh, that might be? Yeah, That's, no, I'm not sure. I'm not. Sure. He might have done. He might have had another band, Caravan. Oh. He's he 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 had a whole yeah a whole mess of bands that he was involved with. Um, and uh, yeah, I should probably look into that. So something to research. Uh, here are other bands. Th these were mentioned in their own interview as influences, such as uh, okay, here's High Tide, British, I believe. Kind of metally. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's mm, cool. Like yeah. you know, you can just just follow following any one of these links. Uh, you can get all kinds of cool music through through Angel and Hexa Syrup. Uh, I think it was Fusao Toda who mentioned also C A Quintet um, and uh, Bobby Calendar. Yeah, see, I don't know. I don't know yeah. these guys. That's a great cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, well, he doesn't have a lot of albums to his name, I think, but uh, definitely worth checking out. On the Japan side, we have like classic psychedelic rockers like Jax. Huh. And, yeah, these guys are pretty famous. Uh, and one of the main dudes there, uh, Mr. Yoshio Hayakawa. Also mentioned in the same interview, uh, Ms. Mina Nakao mentions this band, Sugar Kite, uh, which she played in. So maybe she's cheating there a little bit. Uh, it was a very short lived project, Sugar Kite. Uh, and uh, Hiroshige, Jojo Hiroshige also cool, mentioned uh, Hana Densha, you know, <laughs> uh, very kind of quite heavy duty. It is heavy blood. The music is pretty heavy blood, much heavier than Angelin heavy syrup. Uh, more consistent with the alchemy roster, but uh, yeah. So those are just some of the influences there. All worth, all worth your while, worth checking out. If you have any interest in you know psychedelic prog, all that kind of crap, you know. Yeah. So there you go. All right, Mister Soggy. Yeah. Soggy San, Soggy Sama. <laughs> Greg, do you have any uh, questions or thoughts? I was just thinking, um, no, it's um, Jason, what about when we may not have time to get into this, or there may, yeah. maybe there's no connection at all, but, um, you know, when I was in Japan, I, I traveled to Osaka to see Acid Mother's Temple. Right. And, and is there, so they're, you know, a very much a psychedelic band and fairly experimental from yeah. Osaka. Is there uh, any connection? Well, yeah, Acid, Acid Mother's Temple is another one of those that I feel is connected to, for me, is kind of feeds into, uh, you know, uh, the, all that music coming out on PSF. Okay, That's, yeah. I don't think, I think they released stuff on, you know, their own, label and stuff like that but uh you know definitely um you know the, the you know they're very much connected with that um the main the main dude from the from the band uh what was his name i forget i can't um, remember either um Moto, i went to uh, he was a very friendly guy i um oh you met the guy yeah and kale Dave, what's that guy from Montreal, Cal? Yeah, I forget his last name. But um... <laughs> anyways, we all went back. I mean, they played at a small club in Osaka, and I had, oh, yeah? I had, I don't know how I heard of, I heard about them. Maybe other bands referenced them. Mojo Magazine, and they're on the cover of Wire Magazine, and um, so I took the train to Osaka to see them, thinking they'd be in a, they were in a, a, a very small club, and then the band just left, and I don't even know if I was with anybody but i just kind of followed the band back to the the guy's house and we uh i and a couple other gaijin and we hung out all night I, oh, yeah? and then he, he drew me a map to get to the train station let me yeah. see i think i have that magazine um try and find out his name 
You got Yeah. So probably Makoto Kawabata, you know, being yes. the leader of this band. He's he's very much connected with uh all those psychedelic heroes from from way back. Uh he he's got a huge slew of projects that he's been involved with. Uh and uh yeah, Acid Mother's Temple is one of them, but uh you can you know you can just see if you just go to the, his, his Discogs entry, he's involved in in lots of really, really amazing projects. Uh, personal favorite being Toho Sada, which is a short-lived project, uh, which he did with uh, the main guy behind, behind PSF, Asahito Nanjo. Uh, and uh, was he mm. the main guy behind PSF or a La Musica? Anyway. Yes, Greg, you were at that guy's house. Yeah, Kawabata. Hmm. Um, I, I must say, I maybe I met. That's where I met Cal, and we were talking, and then we we just I don't know. Somebody knew the the band, and and then maybe there was talk we were going to go to an izakaya, but we we went to his house, and uh, yeah, I mean the guy was as as cool as as you could hope envision. Um, that any musician you respect would be, you know, um, totally down to earth and yeah. Um, Kale had to leave the party early, but uh, yeah, it was great. He was really, was totally cool. And then yeah, drew me a little map to uh, get to the train station. Um, yeah, and yeah, I remember I'm a pretty big wrestling fan. I think, you know, like wrestling, you know, Wow, so wrestling, wrestling figures keeps, keeps coming up, huh? Just it like uh, the slap, slap happy Humphreys was also a, yeah. a yeah. wrestling. No, they, they 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 really love these wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, the PSF guy was actually this guy. Yeah, oh. uh, Hideo Ikezumi. Yeah, PSF but, stands oh, for what, Jason? Uh, well, uh, you know, I used to think, like, when I was a kid, I thought it stood for Pretty Strong Factory Records, but it was actually named after uh, the first album by High Rise called Psychedelic Speed Freaks. Hmm. Yeah. And that, that band, uh, yeah, that was it's one of the great psychedelic bands that is definitely worth checking out. Ah, oh, sorry, well... Uh, the band is High Rise. High Rise again was mentioned as a major you showed their picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. All right, uh, guys, shall we? Shall we wrap this up? Yeah, yeah. We're good. All right. Yeah. Well, if, yeah. If, uh, if you don't mind, I'll. We can. If if we could go out with a final clip from the Angels. And okay. Yeah, All yeah. right. Here, let me on. Okay. Well, Soggy, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. In your historical perspective of Angeline Heavy Syrup or Angeline Heavy Syrup. How do you usually pronounce it? Either way. <laughs> and uh, okay, so we're going to go out with another track from uh, the album. Yep. Yeah, which track? This is the closer. Uh, okay. in, yeah. the, in the English version, it's called Fate. In the yeah. Japanese version, has a different um, title. All right. Uh, all right. Well, viewers, thank you for joining us again for Blown Speakers. Greg, as always, thanks for your hey. diligence. And uh, Jason, thanks for coming. Yeah, hey, yes. my pleasure, guys. It's been good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hope your the next your minds blown speakers. and speakers have been blown. <laughs> <laughs> and anything else? No. <laughs> this is a family. Show. All right, crank Split. it up, Jason. All right, the, the final track of the final album of the swan song, possible swan song of Angeline Hevisera.